yeah, yeah. Oh! Tight, my name. Tight, 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 my name. Hey. Hey. I do not feel no pressure, I just put in extra effort. I do not feel no pressure, I just put in extra effort. I do not feel no pressure, I just put in extra effort. I do not feel no pressure. Hey, look, I won't fold under pressure. Want a meal, nothing less. I won't fold under pressure. Searching for a buried treasure. I won't fold under pressure. So them grams I had to measure. I got into e commerce because one day. I was about to go bankrupt back in 2001 because I had got into a real estate deal that went south and I got left with the mortgage. And all of a sudden I had two mortgage payments. I was on a regular, you know, nine to five and it was about to break me. So I was ready to go bankrupt. I had actually started filling out the paperwork and a friend of mine reminded me of eBay. And he's like, well, why don't you sell some stuff on eBay? And I was like, eBay? Really? Isn't that where people sell used socks or something? And he was like, no, you can sell anything. So I started selling my used books because I was an IT guy and I had all these thick IT books that cost a lot of money. So once you read the book or learn the language, then you don't need the book really anymore. Started selling those on eBay. That was enough to get me through the rough spot and uh, after a while it was like wow what else can I sell basically Miva is a solution for e-commerce, pure play e-commerce, to have their own store built. And the store can be fashioned any way they like. So Miva is a very, very interesting platform for you to build a store on. So I'm talking to these people that are either Miva users, just straight up e-commerce folk, and some developers are even there that work with the Miva infrastructure. And uh, we got to talk to them about some cool stuff that's going on in the world of Amazon. But one of the things I really did bring forward for them is that you need to talk to your customer way more than you might have used to have to do to make a sale. Before, people used to say, touch a customer seven times before they buy. I really think that number is way way higher at this point. How many times does an ad need to be shown to a customer before they take action? How many times? Thank you. Anybody else got a different number? Everybody heard it takes seven or eight times, right? Yeah, just nod with me because I know you're dead. Nod, just let me make sure that you're still, yeah? All right, seven to eight times, but I just want to know, who made that up? Who made that up? Can anybody tell me where it came from? I can tell you. Thomas Smith, 1885. 1885, this book, I'm looking for this book right now. I wanna find this book, Successful Advertising. Look, if I could successfully advertise in 17, or 1885 and overlay that to this we got today, I'm gonna be bad. I wanna find out. So he's the first one that talked about the touches and the real deal is he actually said that the number of touches was not seven, but I'm gonna show you where it came from. So he says basically that the first touch, the first time people get, look at any given ad, they don't even really see it. On average, most people don't see your ad the first time. The second time, they see it, but really don't notice that they're seeing it. The third time, they become aware that your ad is there. The fourth time, they have a sense that they've seen that ad somewhere before. I've seen that before. Yes, you saw it three times, man. The fifth time, they actually read it. It's like, okay, that's kind of interesting. Let me read it. So here's the first five times that they've seen your ad. We're spending so much money on these. These should be those one, two, three, five, ten cent ads. This is low hanging fruit. Grab that and this is where you brand. This is like you're, you start putting up things that are just billboard branding type. Little videos with your words or your logo on top. Why? Because they're not even paying attention yet. 
The sixth time, they thumbed their nose at the ad. Ah, I've seen that ad before. Seven times, like, am I seeing this ad again? And that's where the seven comes from. That's where the seven comes from. They stop. They say, hey, they're irritated. They've seen it seven times. Either they're going to, you know, shit or get off the pot. And we stop. But that's because we paid so much for the first touches. I'm telling you to change your strategy and stop paying a lot for those first touches. Just go really broad and let people see your ad. And also let them know that, hey, Amazon is not your friend. They are a business partner and they are actually going to do whatever it takes for them to be successful, not necessarily you as a third party seller on the platform. So that was my speech for that week. One of the cool things about the location was it was just absolutely beautiful. I mean, like it's on a golf course. The hotel sits right on a golf course. So you're sitting here looking at the rolling hills. It was just beautiful, right? The other thing though was they fed us breakfast every morning. They fed us three times right because we got some food the day we got there so it's like two and a half days because the first night is a network meet and greet open bar and it was definitely a great time awesome event yeah we went around and we talked to the vendors in the hallway they have great vendors that are really focused on helping your business grow. From a merchant perspective, how fast do I get the money once they're approved? We will initiate the payment within 24 hours. So uh, that means that we'll initiate it and then it's up to your bank. Usually the longest you'll wait is maybe two to three days after the uh, invoice is created. And I really appreciate the entire Miva team. They're very professional. They treated us very well. And of course, their leadership is where it comes down from Rick Wilson, he's a fantastic guy. The event that he runs is absolutely fantastic and he just put out a book called Dragon Proof. It's a fantastic book because it's talking about how to survive in the age of Amazon if you are a pure play e-commerce seller. Back in the mid 2000s, there was this Tickle Me Elmo. Tickle Me Elmo made me a lot of money because I recognized that it was gonna be a hot toy for the Christmas season. And I went out and I bought as many Tickle Me Elmos as I could find. And I literally had a van full. And I bought those around October, early November, and I held those until like two weeks before Christmas. And I was flipping Tickle Me Elmos for like 300 bucks a pop. <laughs> that was the go, go button for me. And from that, I started my own business doing e-commerce, left my nine to five, and pretty much been doing that ever since. So the conference is over, I'm in San Diego, and I'm thinking about it because I've got to go to Vegas in three more days. Should I go back to the East Coast to my home and hang out for a day or two, or go straight to Vegas? You're sitting at a golf course resort, and you're like, hmm, should I leave here and go home? <laughs> it's like, nah, I'm gonna stay an extra day, then get to Vegas a night early, you know, and get to hang out a little bit before I speak. And another thing is too, I mean, you know, travel has its wear and tear on your body. And when I get to Vegas, I have to speak four times. I got four appearances. I gotta do two keynotes, a breakout session, and a panel. I probably need to get a little bit of rest versus flying, you know, all those hours back and then flying all the way back to the West Coast again. It's early morning, time to get out of San Diego and we're off to Vegas. So Vegas is the next trip. We're going to the ASD show, the biggest vendor show in Vegas. It's a marketplace show. You're gonna see a lot of vendors from uh, all over the country that make all kinds of things from either here, China, Mexico, all kind of good stuff. And we're gonna speak you know, a couple of times at that show, so it should be, I don't know, it should be awesome. All right, first night in Vegas, I'm in chill mode. I have some friends that live in Vegas, so one of my buddies, he calls me up and he's like, hey, let's go to a show. 
And I'm like, eh, okay. So we go to the show that night. It was a great show. I'm so glad I went. We had a wonderful time. But also, it was like, you know, after the show's over, I got to get up. I remember we were sitting in a casino outside of the show. I look at my watch and it's almost 11 o'clock. And I'm like, dude, I have got to get up in the morning for a keynote speak. I left that. The next morning, got up at 6 a.m., right? So 6 a.m., have to get up, get dressed, try to look pretty. Who gets up at 6 a.m. in Vegas? That's when most people are coming back home, right? So I'm watching all these people in Vegas now at 6 a.m. I'm up, they're getting back to their room doing the walk of shame. I get dressed, go to that breakfast. Really great networking. It's, I mean, it's an opportunity for you to really meet the other speakers because a lot of times when other speakers are on, you're doing something else or they're doing something else, you know, you're in and out. Eat, meet and greet, hit the stage. I get there, there's nobody there other than one person, the guy that's the sound guy, which was really cool because we got time to just soften it up. I got to get run through because sometimes if you're in the middle, you don't get a good run through. Definitely guys, make sure you come back at 10 o'clock so I can fill up some seats, bring your family, your friends, bring your children. We're gonna have hot dogs, hamburgers, popcorn, clowns, and uh, uh, a bubble blower, and maybe a, a roller coaster. I'm bringing a roller coaster in and everybody gets a ride. And that's the one thing you're gonna do. If you're the opening keynote, get there early. That way you can Make sure all your sounds work, your slides are working, all that goodness before you get on stage. Another thing that happens, if you're the main or you're the morning keynote, I want you to understand that people are always going to be late for the first keynote, right? So I already know that 30 minutes into my keynote, that's when the room fills up. By the time it was over, the, the place was packed. I got swamped at the end just with questions, people wanting to, you know, tell you how you did and all that kind of good stuff. But that's one of the things you want to keep in mind when you're the opening keynote. Don't freak out if the room's empty. It's only because people are just genuinely late. One of the, one of the topics that I spoke about that I thought was very important for that audience was really about building your own brand. Because there's a difference between having a quote brand that is a shelf brand and a actual brand that is something that you can charge higher price for. Matter of fact, there's a saying that if you tell me you have a brand, the question I ask is can you charge a higher price for it? If your answer is no, then you don't really have a brand. For example, but when I was a kid and you go to the picnic, they'd have Big K Cola, right? Big K, the Kmart brand. Big K is a Kmart brand you only see in Kmart. That's a shelf brand, an in-store brand. Outside of that, nobody's looking for Big K. Now, what is the deal with that brand? The Big K brand is cheaper than the name brand. So the name brand, which is like a Coke or a Pepsi, they're able to charge more simply because of the name recognition. Why are we drinking Big K? Because ain't nobody trying to pay all that money for these people they don't know. Because it's like, ah, I love my family, but I'm not buying real Coke. So that's the difference between a brand Coke and an in-store in shelf brand Big K. After the keynote, um, I watched the next guy speaking and I got with my buddy Jason. And Jason was like, hey, I don't speak until three. Well, what are you guys doing? I'm like, I'm not doing anything. He's like, you want to go to lunch? I'm like, awesome, yay. So Jason takes us to one of the best barbecue places in Las Vegas. Rolling around with Jason is always an awesome time. It's an educational time. Plus, he's just a big personality and fun to hang with. Hi, my name is Jason T. Smith, and I am America's number one thrifter. I live here in Las Vegas. And yes, I used to have a TV show called Thrift Hunters and I'm soon about to be the new guest star on Pawn Stars. Jason is my client, and it, it, years back, he came to me and he said, you know, uh, I'd like to take my speaking business to the next level, and I think you would be a, you know, a good mentor. I've been teaching forever, uh, in person, online, and gave away a lot of information for free, and uh, kind of like a drug dealer, I give away the first taste for free, and then you gotta pay. The problem is, I give away every taste for free, and I didn't know what to do. And so I came to John, I said, I want to go to the next level. And I, I figure, I, I think you're the guy to do that for me. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, man, I don't want to do this. 
I don't want to do it, but I, I, I told him, I remember I said, look, if you would take instruction from me, then I'll do it, you know? And I mean, he's been one of the best students of understanding that I've ever worked with. Literally, when you, you give him a task, he completes the task. And that's why he's had so much success growing his business from just doing like free speaking gigs to doing six and seven figures back in work from his speaking, teaching, and training. So it's been a great ride, a great partnership, and that's kind of what I help speakers do is to monetize their back end so that they can find more repeatable income in their business, which is speaking. Speaking is a business. So I got into thrifting when I was six years old. My grandma and my mom took me to a flea market. And back then, in the early 70s, flea markets were just antiques, 100-year-old items. And to a six-year-old, seven-year-old, not exciting, but I was enthralled with the people who were selling around me and uh, actually wandered away from my mom. <laughs> She freaked out, but she found me talking to a vendor. I was like, what are you doing? Why are you selling this? And then when I was 10, I was taken to a neighborhood uh, community sale. And uh, by the time I was sitting there, I had two jobs. And so I had a good 40 bucks saved up. And I found out you can buy four times as many used toys as new toys. From that point, I was hooked because I'd rather have more toys than new toys. Working with John is pretty good because John definitely handles all the stuff that most people don't want to handle customer service, setting up the launches, doing the advertising. Again, it's all stuff I could do, but man, he does it so well, and he's such an expert at it that he just says, what are we working on next? And I'll tell him, all right, here's my next thing I'm teaching. He sets it up, I show up, we teach, it goes well. And you know, we, we have uh, headaches from time to time, and between me being Mr. Social and him being Mr. Business, we get them all worked out, and so it's a good yin and yang to, to work together the creative and the, uh, you know, the numbers guy, basically. So, uh, and John gets gets things taken care of pretty quick, too, so that's nice. I wasn't sure, you know, when we first started this, I'm like, oh, this is, am I parking up the right tree or not? And uh, it ended up being, yeah, John is the right tree to park up, so. Well, hi, John. And then it just really hit me. I was about to go back, and I'm like, hmm, well, Jason, do you think you could drop me at the hotel? Because I need a nap. Daddy needs a nap, you know? I'm not 30 years old anymore. Although I get it, I look it, but I'm not. So after the nap, I wake up, I'm a little refreshed now, and believe it or not, another party, another meet and greet, time to go drink and glad hand with folks. What was that hotel? Waldorf. It was the Waldorf Astoria, you know, which I've never heard of. Well, I've heard of it before, like in the New York area. You go in, there's a guy standing there with the sign telling you where to go to the party. And he greets you, and he takes you around to the elevator. Then he rides the, up in the elevator with you. I'm like, where? what's going on, right? Why are, why are you in this elevator with me? I don't need that much escorting. We get up to the top floor. There's another guy with the sign telling us this way. So we get that way. And you walked into the room, and it was a small, regular room. I'm like, okay. And who else? Sure. Oh, okay, where is the suite? We're on the penthouse floor. What's going on? So they checked us in, gave us little armbands and the whole nine. And then you walk through that room, through another room. So it was like two single, regular type, you know, bedrooms, and then the master suite, the major suite. Great view of Vegas Strip. It was awesome, nice facilities. And I'm just gonna tell you, I will walk through your hotel room if you're having a party in the master suite. I wanna see the whole suite, because there's not a whole lot of people there. Right? One of the other things I like to do is I like to get there early, right, or on time, just so I can post up and chill, or get the food before everybody starts putting their hands on it, because I don't like other people's hands on the food. So at any rate, I walked through, the bathroom was spectacular, right? They had a gym in the master suite bedroom. That was crazy, right? Your own private gym. I was like, oh, that's pretty awesome. Within 30 minutes, that place really started to fill up. And within an hour, it was packed, like wall to wall. There with my buddy Troy, I was across the room. He's sitting over here and we do that eye thing. I'm like, you ready to go? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to go. It's getting crowded up in here. 
walk to the bathroom, come out of the bathroom, see a friend of mine, start talking to him, get a little bit caught up for a few minutes. Here comes security. Everybody has to get out. <laughs> <laughs> you got too many mofos up in this room. They literally had probably 300 people in that one master suite. Shut it down, kick everybody out of the master suite. It was absolutely crazy. And people are just like, what just happened? What the hell? Okay, here is a tip, guys. If you come to Vegas and you rent a giant suite, don't have too many people in your suite and definitely don't let people hang out in the hallway because you will get kicked the fuck out. Jason invites us over to this other party and I was like, I don't know, man. It's a private party. I wasn't actually, you know, invited. And uh, he asked the uh, host, Andy and Leron, if I could come up to their suite. And they're like, yeah, sure. So we get there, they have a nice little bar, drinks. It was nice. The suite was as big as the one we got kicked out of, but this suite had maybe 25, 30 people in it. So it was really chill mode. We sat around, had some good conversations. I, I really enjoyed the fact that their room, instead of a gym, they had the kind of gym I like working out in, which is a big conference room table, right? So we're sitting in a conference room that is inside of a suite, you know? Really crazy, the things that they put in these suites. So we were sitting there just chilling, having drinks, meeting new people, and really connecting. Here's the thing when it, when it comes to the, the networking part. You have to understand, especially as a speaker, that there are people in the audience there are people at the event that have connections to other people or are connected themselves running events. A lot of the opportunities that I get, I get simply from the networking. So the networking part is very important. It might feel like, you know, you're just hanging out and having drinks. But when those people think about, hey, who moved me? What speakers could I use? Who could I recommend to another person? They're gonna remember you, not only because you were on stage, because most people really forget what you do in about 90 minutes after you're on stage. What they really will remember is your personality. And the more time you spend with them, the more they get to know you as a person. We recommend people that we like. I've always liked speaking, right? <clears throat> I mean, when I was a kid, I remember a young brother was a DJ and he invited me over to one of his parties and nobody was dancing. And he threw a mic in my hand. He said, make them dance. I'm like, what am I supposed to say? He's like, I don't know, just say something and get them up. So I got them up and started moving the crowd, you know, throw your hands in the air, all the stuff I heard on rap records from New York. And I don't know, man, I think it was the power of using your voice to actually change the mode of the room, make people respond. It was so natural for me. And I had a pretty good career, you know, as an MC. Even had a record out and made a video, all that kind of crap. I recognized that I was able to not only do it in the rap phase, but also be able to communicate. I've always been a good communicator. So the next day, I'm kind of happy because I don't have to speak until like noon. <laughs> right? So I'm not the first one, but I am the keynote for that one uh, because they had a morning keynote and then they have an afternoon keynote. Yeah. Second day in Vegas, what are you thinking? Second day in Vegas, only one more to go. <laughs> <laughs> so we do this, uh, what is it, opening again? So that's three opening keynotes, three days in a row. Last night was fantastic. Met a lot of great people and connected and reconnected with a lot of people I see at the show. Great people, man. I had a ball last night. We had a good breakfast that morning and, you know, got some chill time, then got ready, rolled out to uh, the conference. This is for internet retail and internet retail has a stage at the ASD show in Vegas as well. So I'm on a different part of the stage. It's more intimate and I have a table where they allow me to show off some stuff. It, it was really, really a good time. I'm, I'm just thinking about how important it is to be able to connect even when you have this smaller audience. It's like they only got like maybe 20 chairs, but it's in the center hallway and all the traffic walks by that stage. And if you're projecting in a small way, nobody's stopping, but you project in a big way and it's like people 
crowd around and stand and they watch the show, right? Especially if you're putting on a show. Part of the show is great content, but also it's great personality. So I don't care if you're speaking to one person, a thousand people, a hundred people, no matter the size, make sure that you are putting everything into your presentation because you never know who's in the audience. And I did get another uh, opportunity to speak from speaking at that one little spot. And I got a client too. My name is Cal Rison Whitaker. I'm originally from Ohio. I recently just moved here to Las Vegas and uh, I just listened to John Lawson. Uh, John Lawson is phenomenal, man. He dominates. Uh, He's very straightforward. He gives you the facts. Uh, no holes bar. You know, if you really want to learn something, you really want to get into your industry and really expand and grow, man, that's the guy to listen to. Um, it, where I'm at now, if it wasn't for me listening to the information that he was given and, you know, even doing some of the courses that he provides, I wouldn't be here. Fast forward to around 2009, and a friend of mine was having a conference talking about e commerce. And I had made a video on YouTube that ended up really kind of going viral. And this is early days of YouTube videos too. She invited me over to talk about how making that video sold more product. I got on stage and I did it. Bam, that was day one. After that, I kind of got the bug. Well, I enjoyed John Lawson, he's a lot of fun. I learned a lot of things. Uh, a lot of things about the, uh, the whole idea of how you use a messenger and play Facebook. No, I'm scared of that because I use Messenger and Facebook and I realize I'm going to get a bunch of his ads in there now. He's like a cup of nuclear coffee in the morning. I was sleeping when I walked in and now I'm awake and I feel like I need to do some SEO. I thought it was great. It was oh, informational and it was always entertaining. John Lawson is an absolute genius. Absolute genius. I've had the pleasure of working with him up close in a um, spur of the moment kind of mastermind session where I've gotten a lot of good nuggets about business, about, um, he just did a session about AI and robotics, bots, right? Which is amazing, I didn't know half that stuff that he was talking about. His knowledge in selling through Amazon and some of the other sources is just phenomenal. And at the end of the day, if you listen to what he has to say, and you listen to the, and it's tips. They're little tips that are easy to apply, little tips that are easy, but they take your business so much further than where you were. When I, that's what I think about when I think about John Lawson. That was so dope. John, John, John Lawson was dope, killed it. What, what did you like most about him? Um, his enthusiasm, his, um, his realness. He came, he came not only prepared, but he brought it the way he brings it. And, and, and that's very unique to find these days. I think most speakers tend to lend to words like out of the park and uh, it is what it is and all these crazy things. He brought what he does because he's an expert at what he does and he brought it to everyone today and it was very exciting. Another group that I was part of was going to have an event and they were saying, where should we have the event this year? We had it in Vegas, we had it in New Orleans. So I said, you guys should have it here in Atlanta. Right, have it here in Atlanta. So it was a way for me to get in good with the leadership. They was like, okay, we'll do Atlanta, yay. And I was like, okay, well I could be the, you know, the guy on the ground going around, checking out the logistics and helping you guys. And I figured they were going to give me an opportunity to speak. And the call comes in, you know, would you be interested in hosting a panel? <laughs> I was like, dude, I wanna speak. I wanna do slides. Event starts, I have a panel, I, three people on stage, I introduce the three people on stage, and I go, but wait, I've got a few slides I want to share with you. I start speaking for about 15 minutes, and I could see the, the organizers at the back of the room like, what the hell is he doing? While I was talking, another guy in the audience did the same event, but he did it for Australia and he heard me speaking there. And he's like, as soon as I got off stage, he runs up to me, he's like, you're coming to Australia. I want you to do a keynote. I'm like, yeah, right, this is not really happening. Like John's uh, ability to communicate. He brings humor and he brings great insights. He spends a lot of time on the road and, and attending different shows and he's got a big following and that's why we brought him back for 10 years in a row. The audience love him. His sessions are always extremely well attended and John's a giver. He gives out 
information which actually helps people. And people appreciate that. That's why they keep coming back. That's what I love about him the most, I guess. He's my brother. Everything has been, you know, just a snowball effect. The more people that see me, the more opportunities I got. It's really just about taking advantage of the opportunities. People talk about luck, and then there's that other saying about luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So I have a lot of luck because I am definitely always prepared, and anytime there's an opportunity, I'm gonna jump on it.